Howdy, high point. How are you guys doing? All right. So we're doing this series called Dark Christmas, where we're looking at kind of the gritty part of the story of Jesus coming, and that there are a number of things in that story that are a little dark, and that you don't really appreciate the reality of this story until you begin to grapple with some of these things. And when you do that, I think the story becomes a lot deeper, right? And so this morning, last week we talked about um, Mary and Joseph and how it, it cost them their good name. It cost them a lot to um, receive Christ and to be his earthly parents and that they knew that and it was, but that Jesus is better, Jesus, the name of Jesus is better than your good name. And um, so you can listen to that online if you want. Anyway, today we're talking about the, the, the not parable, the narrative about the Magi. And essentially what the dark, the dark nature of this is that I don't think people really um, grapple with, I know I have to really work to grapple with it myself, is that accepting that the truth is completely outside your experience feels like burning your whole self to ashes. To find the truth. To recognize that the truth, what you really have been looking for and what you want in your most honest and noble moments, that to recognize that truth is so foreign to what and who you are in your personal experience um, that you realize that in order to access it, to believe in it, to live in it, to to possess it relationally, means that you, you have to endanger the entire loss of yourself. Everything that you think you are has to be put on the chopping block. And that is essentially um, the darkness or the difficulty or the pain of this passage about the Magi, I think, if we read it clearly. Um, I want to talk about three things from this passage. The first one is that <clears throat> Jesus is for all people. He is the rightful king and ruler of all peoples, and all people can come to Jesus, and all who do are right to come to Jesus. And one of the things that is most profound about the fact of the passage of the Magi is that they actually came. Um, We talk a good bit about sometimes who the Magi were. Some of you grew up calling them the three kings of Orient, whatever. We have no idea how many there were. Um, the word is plural. We, they, they, we don't even know if there were, we, there could have been women. We don't know. Um, there's some people that think it was a large group of people. But ultimately, what, ma- what, what are magi, right? It's where we get our word magician, right? But that's actually not a very helpful translation. The magi in the ancient world were essentially, essentially the knowledge class. It would be kind of like if we put together our pastors, all the occultists, the astrologers, the tarot card readers, all of them, all of the scientists, and all of the academics, and squished them all into one group of people, that would be the magi, the the magi, the wise men, as they're called. It's the people that trade in knowledge, knowledge of all kinds. You see, it's only in the modern world that we have come up with this sort of strange prejudice that you split up these things, and so facts have nothing to do with meaning. In the ancient world, that wasn't the idea. And so knowledge, what, what is a fact? meaning, the significance of something morally and spiritually, and well-being, what we can get out of it, we're all together, which is sort of rational. And so, did you get superstition? Yes. But why wouldn't you, if you were doing chemistry, try to turn lead into gold and do alchemy? Right? Now, we call that superstition now because it, it, they didn't accomplish it. <laughs> we would have called it brilliance if it could have been done. Right? Same thing with the stars. People looked at the orderly nature of the stars, how they seemed not to change but yet move, and they saw that because in astronomy, they naturally did astrology. The fact of the stars probably means something. That's not crazy, right? And so within this class of people, you had all of this mixed together, science and learning and wisdom and proverbs and astrology and in and reading the scriptures and all those things were smushed together so that when Daniel was taken into exile, um, 
he was taught all the learning and literature of the Babylonians. Remember this from Daniel? And when the king had a dream, he went for his dream interpreting occultists. And when they couldn't tell him what his dream meant, he was going to kill all of them, including Daniel, who didn't do that. And, it was, and Daniel was like, hold on, I'm not in the dream interpreting group, but I, if we're all going to die, I would like a shot at the king's dream just for fun. I mean, let's try it, okay? And so then he did that. But, and so the Magi was this very broad group of le- extremely learned people. And we, we talk about them being astrologers sometimes just because in this text it points out that what apparently tipped them off to come at this time, at this place, in this way, was something they saw in the stars. But don't forget that the Old Testament text that actually predicted the time, that is the years, to look for the coming of the Jewish Messiah is in what book of the Bible? It's in Daniel, which existed as in Israel, but it existed just as much in the literature of the Babylonian Medo-Persian Empire. And it was part of the corpus of knowledge of the learned men who read all the texts. And so apparently they put it together as well as anybody else, right? But the thing that's so that's so interesting about them is really is really why they came. When when they came, they knew what they were coming to. They didn't know where. They didn't know where X marked the spot, but they knew everything else. It's kind of like the third Indiana Jones movie, right? They knew everything but Alexandretta, you know? And so they, but they knew they were coming to worship a king who was a god, who was the god, because it explicitly says that in Daniel. Otherwise, I don't know where they got it from. I don't know if the stars say it too. I wouldn't know. One of the things that we need to recognize about this is that we don't have much experience with this. Most of us live as monocultural people. We're just Americans, and that's what we do. And, you know, it's the, it's the classic thing. If you want to know what water's like, don't ask fish, right? Because they just swim in it, and we're like that too. And it's very easy for us to not recognize how much of ourselves is wrapped up in our culture, and our gender, and our family structure, and the metaphors we think by, and all these kinds of things. Like, we don't even realize that just patterns of thought, like, if you use a particular metaphor to think with— that that controls a ton of how you think about things, and that metaphor that you use to think with is very likely part of your culture, right? And there's all this kind of stuff. And until you get hit with the scandal of foreignness, you don't even really realize it's happening, okay? Um, one One of the only times I've ever had to face this more fully is when I was in India for 24 days. And I've been to a lot of places like in Europe or other places where I was in a foreign place. It was clear I didn't know the language, but I felt like I was on the same planet, okay? There are some places in the world that you'll go that are very dissimilar to what you think you know. And India was one of those places for me, and it was just like everything I thought I could do didn't work like I thought it worked. And every way I talked, every idiom I used, every sentence structure, everything I wore, every positioning of my body towards people was telling them stuff I wasn't intending to tell them. Even nodding is done like this, not like this. Which, that sounds like a small thing. I mean, you can pick that up like that. It's harder to do, though. Like, if you go, oh, and they go like this, that's kind of like they're with you. Okay, got it. But then they talk to you, and they kind of naturally expect you to do it, because that's what people do. And it's hard to do that if you don't practice. You know what I mean? It's kind of like trying to get an Indian person to nod. I mean, it, it, apparently nodding is easier. They pick that up faster um, because it's less fluid, you know. It's, anyway, the point is— the point is, it, it, when you think about the Magi coming, you just go, oh, yeah, the wise men came. Isn't that cool? They picked up on things. No, they burned to ashes their whole identity to find the thing that the truths that they were seeking ultimately pointed beyond it to. Of all the things that they studied, of all that they invested themselves in, they saw this one sort of pinprick of light shining through it that pointed to something beyond everything that they were. And the truth demanded that they follow it somewhere and to believe in something that basically said a lot of this was all wrong. And this is who they are. 
And that is one of the most painful human experiences that there can possibly be. Right? It's a little bit like, a little bit like somebody in America wanting, their real passion was to understand human society as it could be people living together. And in order to do that, because they were American, they really believed in the American experiment. And so they, they went into and got a PhD in American studies, and they studied the Constitution, and they studied immigration, and they studied the history of America, and the wars, and how our laws function, and the separation of powers, and the, they read de Tocqueville, and they read Adams, and they read the Federalist Papers, and they did all this because they really wanted to know what it would mean for a people to be free and to live well with each other. And and, and in studying this and pouring themselves into it for 40 years, at one point, sort of in a strange way, they find out that all of this actually points to the place where human beings have done this. And it turns out it's actually in Sasebo, Japan. Right? And all of a sudden, there's this very terrible choice to be made. Right? Because the whole reason they've studied all of this was to find the place of human unity, freedom, and, and beauty. But in studying this, this has become who they are. But in getting the truth they were after all along, they have to let it all go. And follow that one pinprick of light to the other thing that takes them over there. Can, you see what I'm saying? It's, it's really, really strange. And yet, they did it, and they were right to do it. Right? Um, in Isaiah 49, if you've been here a while, I preached this last year one time when we were going through Isaiah, where the, the passage is talking about the servant who is going to be the Messiah, and this is what is said about him. It says, he says, it is a too small thing for you, you the Messiah, the servant, to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob, and bring back those of Israel that I have kept, that is, the Jews. It's too small for you to save only the Jews. He says, I will make you a light for the Gentiles, that's everybody who's not Jewish, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. Now, this is a little bit difficult because the minute you say that, what you're saying is is that there's going to be a Jewish person who is going to be universally applied in salvation to everybody. And on one level, that's very offensive to us as humans, because we feel like a universal salvation really ought to have kind of a universal feel, right? Doesn't that make sense? Um, you know, if there's somebody who comes along who's going to save all athletes, he should, you know, he should be able to not trip, right? I mean, it's like, there's got, there should be some kind of relationship in proportion to this thing, and so it seems like there ought to be like a salvation kind of out there for everybody. Like, when, I mean, like, you should be able to derive religion, right? Because, like, whatever is true, it should be there, and we should all have equal access to it. And the idea that that's kind of weird. Here's the, here's the problem. The Bible says there is a salvation like that. There is a universal salvation that doesn't require the Bible, that's open to everybody, that can save everyone, that you don't need Judaism or Christianity for. It's totally out there. The problem is nobody uses it. That's the problem. The thing we're offended about isn't that it's not there. We assume it's not there because Jesus shows up and he says, you have to come through me. And so we assume there was no other possibility. There was a possibility, just functionally, nobody does it. And it says this in the Bible in a number of places. For example, in Psalm 19, 1 through 4, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out in all the earth, their words to the ends of the earth. Theologians have called this historically general revelation or natural revelation. That is, that apart from the written scriptures— or the coming, the incarnation, presence of Jesus Christ, God has, has spoken in the world, and he has done it in one of those ways through natural creation, and that if we saw the world for what it is, it pours forth speech about God, okay? We just don't listen, right? In Romans, there's this long argument about human nature and salvation and damnation and 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 what the sinful condition is like, and how people sin, and how God offers grace in Christ, and all that kind of thing. But there's one point where he's going along, and he he says this. He says, all who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law, and all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. What that means is this. 
there are some people who have the, the Bible. And if they have the Bible and they don't do what the Bible says, they'll be judged by what the Bible says, and that won't be fun for them, right? And then there's another group of people that don't have the Bible, right? And so they're apart from the law, but they'll be judged apart from the law with the content of the Bible, but not with the Bible, right? And he says the reason why this works, it, he says it in parentheses, he says, indeed, when Gentiles, that's people who don't have the Bible, who do not have the law, do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they don't have the law, since they show that the requirements of law are written on their hearts, their conscience is bearing witness, and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. You see that saying? He, here's what he's saying. He says, listen, if you look at people— Oops, wrong, we're going the wrong direction there. He says, when you, we take the people, the Gentiles here, they don't have the Bible, right? And yet, when they go around and act as human beings, they do a lot of things that the Bible requires. It says you should do this, right? And when they do that, what they, re what they demonstrate is they do have an internal faculty that is telling them positively what they should be doing. And when they do those things that the Bible does require, they're demonstrating they do know what the Bible says already. And so they can prosper and, or they can be judged and they can do it all without the Bible because the Bible's content already exists by nature within a faculty they already possess. Now, what is that? Which is what he answers in the next 20 verses. He says, they show that the requirements of the law, that is the content of the Bible, is written on their heart. And you're like, well, heart's kind of a loosey-goosey thing. Right. And so he clarifies, that is, their consciences, right, that there is, a, there is a moral internal faculty that tells us. And then he says, and here's how you experience it. Their conscience bearing witness, their thoughts now accusing, even defending them. So he says, there is a faculty inside of you that bears witness to the content of the law. It tells you what God requires, both good and bad. And then you have your own thoughts, some of which say, you're, you're not, that's not okay, right? You have thoughts that are accusing you, saying, that's not okay. You shouldn't be doing that. That's not what you were made for. That's not right. You shouldn't treat people this way, blah, blah, blah. And you have other thoughts that say, no, that is right. You should do that, and this is okay, and that person accused you that, but they're wrong. They're being hypocritical, and you should act this way, and right? There's this whole internal mental moral life that says, this is what's true. You shouldn't do this. You should do that. And what he's saying is, that is the Bible. That is, that they contain the same content. The content of the Bible and the content of the human faculty of conscience are telling you, are both telling you the will of God. The difference is, is that the Bible is inscripturated, and you can use it to check how badly you have recalibrated your conscience, because your conscience is something you can mess with. If you don't listen to it, you start to break its calibration. The Bible says that there are some people who have consciences who have been seared like with a hot iron, like they've been cauterized to death by people saying, I'm not listening to you. So, so if your conscience doesn't say, oh yeah, you should listen to that. Be, now be careful and hear what I'm saying. This is only proof that we're condemnable because we have not responded to the universal salvation offered in all of creation through natural revelation. That's what Paul is proving here. He's not proving that you're going to be okay if you listen to what's left of your conscience. What the, what's left of our conscience tells us is, there is something inside us that could have helped us. It does still tell us many things about what God requires and what he tells us to avert, you know, avert from. And so in creation, there is this natural speaking, and there is this internal witness, and every, in every tongue, in every language, to every human being, the natural world speaks. And to every person, in every language, to every human being, the internal divine image speaks in the conscience, and those are sufficient that people should seek him. And now you might say, well, Nick, that's not, that's not very, like, pro-depravity of you. Yeah, but listen to what Paul says when he goes to Athens. So Paul is talking about Jesus. He goes to Athens. It's this totally Gentile place, okay? So it's not like they don't read the Bible there, okay? 
and he goes into the city of Athens, and it's full of temples and idols. And this is his argument. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of the heavens and the earth and does not live in temples built by hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men and that they, sh where th that they should inhabit the whole earth and he determined the times set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. And then he quotes their poets. He's not quoting the Bible now. He's quoting Greek writers. He says, for as some, he says, for in him we live and move and have our being. And as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Now, think about that argument. What's he saying? He's saying that God has spoken— he has spoken in creation, and he has spoken in providence. What he's made and how he has ordered history and peoples. So in such a way as to speak, and his purpose in that was that we would reach out for him and try to find him. And he says, because God isn't far from anybody. In fact, if you read your own Greek poets who are writing out of their internal intuition about the world, seeing the natural creation and feeling the internal conscience, they know that they're his offspring. They know that in him we live and move and have our being. And so he says, therefore, concluding, Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divi divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man, man's design or skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. And he says, the content of that repentance is to believe in Jesus. You see what he's saying? He's saying, is if we paid attention to even what we've written down ourselves, we would know that our alternative worships are wrong. He said, he, he said, listen, you may not know enough to believe in Jesus, but he said, look, I, I'm going around the city. You should have known these idols weren't gods. You should already know that, and you don't. You see the implication? You see, you might have thought I was preaching heresy a little while before, and maybe I am. I don't think so. The, the point is not that a universal, non-particular salvation doesn't exist. That's not the point. There is one. There's totally one. There is a universal, completely universal salvation that exists completely apart from God, from the, the Bible. The problem is, is that the percentage of the human race that avails themselves of it is zero percent. Okay? So you see, we get really upset that Jesus comes and he says, I'm the way, the truth, the life. You need to come in, by, and through me. You need, and we get, oh, it's so particular. This is a general world and we shouldn't have to. Well, listen. We didn't use the general one. Nobody does. We build idols that we should know better. We concoct these religions, and they do not agree with the general and internal revelation. We destroy our own consciences so they become less and less clear dictations of what God would require from us. And we convince ourselves that because we understand the facts of the natural world, it doesn't have the significance God says it does. And so we get offended when God gets particular, when that was our only chance. It was our only chance. He gave us a universal general. We just don't use it. Nobody does. And Paul's perfectly sincere when he said, God, would that you, we would have reached out because he's not far from any of us. But what it tells us is, is that both biblically, because Ephesians 2 tells us this, but also empirically, we are not God-seekers. And we needed a very specific, very particular, very definite, turns out, very human Savior. Theologians sometimes call this um, the scandal of particularity. That is that the minute the Son became a human being, he alienated everybody. <laughs> because there, here's the thing, there, it turns out there are no generic humans. And so the minute you become a human being, you become a man or a woman, rural or urban, smart or dumb, handsome or not so much, right? And when Jesus came into the world, he came as a man, not a woman, because he had to be one or the other. He came, you know, he came, ended up being a carpenter, not a code writer, right? He was a Jew, not a Gentile. He spoke Aramaic, not English. He was, you know, he's 
totally different than you, and here's why. Because every human is. And the minute he became a human, he became necessarily, by experience, foreign to you. That's why when you go into any, any like, white church that hasn't gotten guilt about this and actually, like, corrected it, there's a white Jesus. And if you go to an African-American church, there's usually a black Jesus. And if you travel to Asia, there's usually an Asian Jesus. The only place in the world where you can go to be sure that you're going to get an accurate physical portrayal of Jesus is Israel. And that's just because they're accidentally right, because they have the same sense of he just is their race. It's like a broken clock being right twice a day, right? And this is because Jesus is foreign to us. We feel that foreignness, and yet we want to make him familiar, but not in the right ways. Which brings us to the second point. Because the reason Matthew put the Magi in his gospel actually was not for us to marvel at the Magi, so much as to make us marvel at the Jews. You see, Matthew of the four Gospels was the one most specifically written to a Jewish audience. So why have foreign astrologing, like, wise men be the, like, heroes? And why put them as a foil against the Jewish, te Jewish teachers? And the whole point was irony, right? Um, I don't know if you know this, but, like, I actually really like the superhero movies, and I actually really like Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man. Um, but there's this—so I don't know if you know this, but— Apparently, Robert Downey Jr., when he was 15, like, you got to forgive people for how they behave when they were 15, right? But, like, apparently he's in, he was in high school, and he, like, beat up some kid, took his comic out of his hand, tore it up in front of him, called him a ridiculous nerd, and humiliated him in front of everyone. And the comic that he stole and destroyed was The Amazing Iron Man. And now he's a multi, multi, multi-millionaire because he gets to be Iron Man in, like, four movies a year, Right? And don't, don't get me started on how he's the most ridiculous superhero either, because the brain trauma— he, I mean, never mind. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things that's interesting about the Magi is not just that they came, but they came knowing what they were coming to. The gifts that they brought were very specific. All of the gifts that the Magi brought are found in other places in ancient literature referring to gifts that are given to kings. And they say very specifically, they haven't just come to see the king of the Jews. They have come to worship him. And now think of this. But they don't know where, and so they come to basically this group of people called the Sadducees, which are basically the Magi of Israel, right? And they say, where is this person going to be born? And they know, right? They go, oh yeah, we know. Bethlehem says it in Micah 5. Boom. And they quote it. Sounds like verbatim, like right from the top of their head. Oh yeah, the prophet says this. For you, oh, you know, I'm like, there it is. And then they don't go. I mean, you, I mean, can, you, I mean can you imagine this? Like, they show up and somebody says, like, we've, we've seen a very special star that isn't in the heavens usually. We've come 600 miles, right? We've come to worship the one born king of the Jews. Do you know, do you know where he is? Oh yeah, Bethlehem. All right, well, we're going to go see him. You guys— you guys up for some in and out on the way? And they're like, we're not going, right? And you're like, what, what do you mean you're not? I mean, can you imagine, like, what the Magi must have thought? And be like, okay, wait. It's 10 miles, right? Jerusalem to Bethlehem, it's 10 miles, right? It, you're not going? I mean, like, honestly, I mean, how wrapped up in yourself do you have to be for someone to be like, the king of the universe has shown up 10 miles from here. And you're like, yeah, I'll catch him next time he's in town. You know, it's like, and that's your whole life, right? I mean, it's like somebody who's like a super fan of like some sports team and like the greatest ever is like over in the library. And they're like, yeah, whatever. Now, I say that, but it turns out that actually religious advantages— can actually turn out to be disadvantages. You know this if you've, like, raised a kid in relative affluence. There are advantages that are real advantages that also turn out to be disadvantages, right? And this is true. The, the Jewish people had all the advantages. They had the scriptures. They had the history with God. They had specific promises. They had all this stuff. And yet, when it comes right to it, it didn't, it didn't go, right? But I was listening to one of our interns, Chris Helding. He's preaching in the, um, the youth area. And of course, I have to watch his sermon so I can yell at him about it. 
And one of the things he said, he says, listen, I, you know, in our culture, we've, the church has taken to sort of pleading with the culture not to take Christ out of Christmas. And he, he goes, but, but you know, sometimes I wonder, like, how much Christ is there actually going to be in your Christmas? You know? I mean, I, so I'm the, I'm the pastor, so I'm the holiest person in the church. And so— <laughs> Sorry. Every once in a while, you have to resort to hyperbole. Um, so I'm in my house, and like, you know, we're trying, we're doing the Christmas thing, and trees, and whatever, and gingerbread houses, whatever. And so we turn on Christmas music, and of course, one of the easy things to do, so you don't have to listen to Bing all day, sing the same four songs, is to just, you know, like, turn on Pandora, and like, go to the Christmas station and play it, right? And so we're listening to the Christmas music, and we're doing the thing, and whatever, and, um, and at some point, as, after like two or three hours, I'm kind of like, what? what Christmas channel are we listening to? Because I've heard the dirty Christmas songs like three times, right? Like the like, it's cold outside song. Like that's, that's dirtier. That's even dirtier than the snowman who can do the job when he's in town. Okay, I mean, it's not, this is not kid-friendly stuff. And not one song about Jesus, right? But it's not like we were like, okay, here's what we do. We're going to pick a station with Christmas music that doesn't mention Jesus, right? The way Jesus gets excised from all of our Christmases is it just happens, right? That's just—it's just entropy. It's just—it's the same reason we didn't respond to the, the general salvation. We're dull to the special salvation, and so what naturally happens is—I mean, let me just give you—I'll just give you a test, right? On Christmas morning— Gather everybody who lives in wherever you live and read the Christmas story to them out loud, right? How many people felt uncomfortable at the thought of having to do that right then, right? Lot, most of you are liars, right? Mo, I mean, like, I'm the pastor. It makes me feel uncomfortable. I'm like, so I got to just tell them to sit there. I'm going to read out loud, and they're going to just sit there while their presents are in the room <laughs> and while we're cooking pancakes, right? It just doesn't feel like it's going to work, right? And I'm— but yet, like, do we do anything that makes our Christmases, right? Now, one of the things that made, made me think of this is that, you know, High Point Church is within this general church world of sort of like evangelical Protestantism. And one of the things that people make fun of us about is that we have big churches and lots of Bibles, right? Which is great. It's good stuff, right? You know what's funny? That's exactly what the Sadducees had. Um, it, in the moment when Jesus was born, Herod, who, um, yes, murdered a number of his own sons and wasn't exactly the most trite and um, penitent person in the history of the world, knew that to make nice for the Jewish people, because they kind of hated his guts, he would build the most magnificent religious temple they'd ever had. For 40 years, construction was done in this temple, until it was a wonder of the ancient world. And these Sadducees, as religious leaders— were religious leaders in the finest, most beautiful Jewish temple. It, it was amazing. They had arrived. Their faith in their natural experience was at its zenith, right? And listen, I mean, just think about how we're physical beings. Isn't it easy to, like, walk into wherever you worship and see the place in good repair and to think that, therefore, your faith somehow is? You know what I mean? It's easy. You walk in and everything's nice, and so, so is your faith. And that, those two have no relationship to each other, right? No relationship to each other. Same thing with the, their Bibles. I mean, these weren't people who just had Bibles. These were people who, like, straight knew their Bibles. These are people who, you, who like, called up an obscure verse in the prophet Micah. How many people didn't know Micah was a prophet? Right? I mean, like, Right, Micah. Th I thought that was a countertop, right? And, you're <laughs> and yet, these guys can call it up, recite it from memory. I'm assuming in the original Hebrew. They, they knew it cold, and yet, they didn't go! <laughs> they, just, they, they, they knew it backwards and forwards. And listen, listen, guys. You and I, we can know, we can know it backwards and forward. It doesn't mean a thing. Now, is it an advantage? It is an advantage. 
If you know the Bible, if you know God's word, it's a huge advantage if you pay attention to it. But why do you think Jesus went around saying, blessed is one who doesn't only hear what I say, but actually does it? He said that because that's what typical human beings do. And you see, whenever anybody fails in the Bible, what's our attitude supposed to be? We're supposed to identify with them, right? That's why there's all kinds of failures in the Bible, because that's what typical humans do. We're typical humans because we're all the same. And so when Peter goes, I don't think I believe that, we're supposed to go, oh, I'm just like Peter. And when the Sadducees go, oh, I know the verse for that, but I'm not going to do anything. We're supposed to go, oh, that's me, because it is you. It is me. We are the people that think Jesus is so familiar, and it turns out that what he really wants is so foreign, we don't even know it, and we could be in a church with new Bibles and in good repair and with, you know, whatever, a cheeky pastor and blah, 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 and be not even in the zip code of the outer rings of the will of God for what we're supposed to be and live and do and trust. And we can forfeit all our advantages by con- deceiving ourselves that Jesus is so familiar that he's not insanely foreign, right? Which actually sort of brings us to the third point, which is that the situation that the Magi were in and the Sadducees were in and turns out everybody else in creation was in is all the same thing. You see, by the time John got around to writing his gospel, the other ones had been written, and he knew what the preceding literature had dwelled on, and so he just dispensed with the whole incarnation narrative, other than to tell us exactly its significance. He didn't tell the story. Matthew showed us. John tells us. And what John basically tells us is, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how religious you are. It doesn't matter how foreign you are, right? You could be a You could be an international student. You could be somebody who's grown up in this church since you were, you know, seated. And it it just doesn't make a bit of difference because Jesus is foreign to everyone. That is, he feels radically and dramatically foreign when you when you encounter him as he really is. It doesn't matter if you're a Magi or a Sadducee. It doesn't matter. Jesus feels incredibly foreign, but at the same time, he isn't. He isn't foreign to you at all. No matter how, no matter where you've come from, no matter how long you've been here, he's not foreign at all to you, right? Listen to how John says it. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, that's the Word, was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. And without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. So you've got a character who is the Word, who is, we're going to find out, the Son, but he's the creator, he's the light, he's the life, right? And there, I skipped a few verses that talk about John the Baptist, then it gets back to Jesus in verse 10. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to the world which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who has come from the Father, full of grace and truth. You see what the argument is there? Whatever your personal category, the most important functional category is that you're a human being. That you're part of creation— And the radical problem that Jesus came to solve was that the creation had no idea who the creator was. (laughs) That the creation was in darkness and it couldn't recognize what light was. It didn't know what life looked like. And so it was completely foreign. The thing that should have been the most familiar was the most foreign. That is, human human beings in their sinfulness had lost their memory and couldn't recognize the creator for who he was. And so he comes in, and they, they find him hysterical. Like, you and I, we talk all kinds of raw about God's love for people. We, we, you know, God loves you, and he wants to save you and help you, and, all, and that's all true. But you know how people hear it? They hear it like a madman. 
somebody that they don't even know who you're talking about. They don't, they don't know who they are. They've, they've lost all memory of the person. It's like, it's like a, somebody coming up to them that they don't remember ever meeting and grabbing them and saying, you belong to me. You're mine. I love you. I need you. And people are like, whoa, that you're creeping me out, right? Um, the greatest Christmas movie ever, and I say this objectively, okay, um, because it's the most ennobling, um, is Home Alone. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm, just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's Elf. Um, I'm just kidding. No, I'm, no, is, it's A Wonderful Life, okay? It's the best Christmas movie. Um, you can like whatever you want, but it's, it has, but it has this part that it captures for a different reason exactly what this passage captures, okay? So in this movie, nobody knows George because it's George's fault, okay? George is learning something. But if you connect it to this passage, you can see, according to John, what the incarnation is like emotionally for everybody involved. Watch this for a minute. Mary! George, don't you know me? What's happened to us? I don't know. You let me go. Mary, please. Oh, don't do this to me. Please, Mary. Help me. Where's our kids? I need you, Mary. Help me. Mary, Mary, let me go. Let me go. Let me go. Let me go. He's got to stop him. Tom. Ed. Charlie. That's my wife. Somebody call the police. Somebody in him on the head of the bottle. You need a straight jacket. Get out of here. 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 Stand back. Okay, sorry. You see, there's a sense in which we talk about God loving us and coming to us and seeking us for himself and all these kinds of things. But you see, for a creation that has no memory, that has unwittingly, deliberately forgotten their creator. It seems like hysteria. Jesus seems like George, running around saying, I know you, don't you know me? And you're my wife. And in a sense, the, the Jewish people are like Mary, his wife. Right? It's just like the biggest betrayal that somehow she doesn't know her. But he knows everybody else too, and they're all part of his life and what's going on. And they don't even know that their life stinks, stinks, because he's not in it. They don't even know. They don't even know that Pottersville was Bedford Falls and, and that he had given his life for them and that their lives were dramatically better. They have no memory of that reality anymore. And they're totally— and they think he's some lunatic and they shoot at him, right? And you see, that is what the incarnation is like. That is why we're all magi. Because— it's like some lunatic who somehow knows our name, has some memory of some reality we know nothing about, who declares we belong to us and us to him, and we think he's crazy, and yet it's, be it's because the creation has forgotten its creator. The people have forgotten their king. We have no idea who we belong to. We don't know our identity. And so we get upset that it's so particular, and it's so specific, and why this, and well, how can you ask me to burn my identity to ashes to come to the pinprick of light I see? And I know how you feel. Listen, especially if you're not a Christian yet. I mean, if you're a Christian, it's hard enough, you know? But it's—I mean, if you're not a believer, it, it, it would feel like that to say, right, Jesus, of course. But I'm telling you, you know, you know him even though he feels totally foreign. And it, it sounds like to believe in him would be like to burn your whole life to ashes, to 
put on a Komodo and eat udon noodles somewhere in southern Japan when you're an American studies professor. Like it just, it doesn't even compute. But the problem is, is that there is a conscience that says somewhere inside that you know you actually do belong to someone. That you were created and there is a creator and that you had a king and that your life is significant and that you were meant to live forever and something's wrong with what you've taught yourself and there is something you don't remember that is true. And when this person comes in and goes, listen, you don't know who I am, but I'm this. There's, there is a place inside you that for all the foreign feeling, there's something eerily familiar that is so difficult to accept. But listen, you've got to get your butt on the metaphorical camel and you've got to ride the 600 miles, friend. Because everything you've looked for, when you find the thing that points somewhere else to where it is, you've you got to get together the incense and frankincense and stuff, and you've got to get on the camel, you've got to go, you've got to find the one, and you've got to believe. And you can do that right now. You just tell God you're, you're basically wrong about most everything and that he was basically right, and you need his special, particular, scandalously specific salvation for you in the death and resurrection of Jesus, and that you want, you, you're putting your faith in him, and you want him to produce faithfulness in you, and then you're going to figure out what that means. That's all, you, that's, that's all it takes. You just do that, and you can do it right now. You can stop listening to me right now, and you can do that. And if, if you think that Jesus is familiar, here's one of the things that I need to push you on a little bit when you have all the religious advantages, what you tend to do is to recreate God as though he's actually familiar in all the ways he's foreign. And see, really feel him as, fo as foreign in all the ways he's actually familiar. And it, that's called moralism or legalism or you call it whatever you want to call it. <laughs> but y we should go through each day with a sense of God being so radically unlike us that it is unnerving to our very core. That we have no idea what righteousness really looks like, or humility, or the scope of truth, or what justice looks like. That we have not yet dared to even whatever. That God is so transcendent, so wholly other, that he has this foreignness to him in how he would shape us that we have not yet really grappled with. And we recreate these little us-made images. We're idol makers because we just think we've got to reshape him. And yet, in the very way that we feel like he's totally foreign, that is, that he's not really here, that he doesn't indwell us truly in the person of his spirit, that he's not actually involved in the provident, providence of our life, that's the stuff we don't believe in. We don't believe he's really shaping and guiding our life. We think we're doing that. We don't think God is in us and indwelling us and reshaping us spiritually. We just think that's something we think, and, but we don't, because we don't feel it, we don't think it, we don't believe God is everywhere present, and that we're never alone, and those things feel foreign. And everything about God gets reversed oftentimes in the hearts of those who have all the religious advantages, and you and I have to burn all that to ashes again and again every time we can, and seek to see Jesus as absolutely foreign as he is, so he can burn to ashes all of our sin and self-will and desire to be different than him and to not be remade like him and in his image. And yet, to find him so familiar as our own parent, our rightful ruler, our loving creator, and our complete savior. That is the pain of the magi. That is the difficulty of losing yourself to find yourself. That is what is wrapped up in believing in Jesus. And it is one of the most painfully difficult things a human being can ever do. And the most worthwhile. And the most necessary. So I hope you have a very dark Christmas in that sense. Because it's the best kind. Let's pray.